Good evening. Welcome to those joining us at Parkhouse the Spiker and those who are joining us online. Um, we might have um, listeners here today who are joining us from almost 8,000 kilometers away from one of the Caribbean islands we'll be talking about tonight in our panel. Um, you might be calling in from one of those Caribbean islands that has faced historical and current and ongoing colonization by the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And we are going to talk about your real about your lived reality today and what you want and what reparation looks like. We will reflect on the impact of historical colonialism, the impact that stolen land, stolen bodies and just absolute greed has had on us. We will talk about the current situation in which the islands fall under a variety of schemes under the Dutch Kingdom. This panel is a part of the Week Against Racism, which is a cooperation between Parkhaus de Spijker and Comité 21 Mart, and it's organised yearly by the Alliance Together Against Racism, Sam and Teich and Racism. In a climate changed world where it's been known for decades that small island states are particularly vulnerable to losing their homes, because of sea level rise, because of increased in intensity of storms and hurricanes, and different slow onset effects such as salination of agriculture. It is absolutely unacceptable that the Dutch state is not showing the political will to do everything that it could do to mitigate emissions, phase out all the industries and all the practices that are causing harm implement strong policy of adaptation, increase resilience, and make sure that all the loss and damage that's on its way can be cushioned. Moreover, there's a lack of public outrage about the well-being and safety of the Caribbean Dutch citizens here in the European Dutch climate movement, which is really emblematic of how segregated our lives are. And Unfortunately, it's yet another indicator that in the Dutch Caribbean, Dutch citizens endure a second-class citizenship. My name is Gargi Sharma. I am really excited to be your host tonight. I come from India, which a lot of people don't know, used to be a Dutch colony from 1602 to 1824, until the Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1824 in London, where the Dutch and the English decided how they were going to distribute the colonies amongst themselves. The English took my country, the English took Malaysia. Um, the Dutch decided to go with the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia, colonizing that part of the world. And I'm here today in solidarity with my siblings who have experienced colonization as my ancestors did who are experiencing colonization as we do today, who are experiencing the impacts of colonialism, not just in our lands, but also in our beings, no matter which part of the world that we live in. Today, in the first half, we will listen to, from uh, our speakers about the different ways that climate racism manifests in their environments or in their political histories. In the second half, we will discuss into we will discuss the idea of reparations. We will discuss where do we go from here. If at this point it's not enough to just say, okay, bad things have happened. Now what? What are the concrete things that the Dutch government can do to make up for lost time, to make up for the harm that's done, and maybe try to make a dent in what has happened over the last centuries. In in the Dutch colonies. Um, you can ask your questions by phone. You can go to menti.com and you'll be able to see the code behind me. And um, we'll try to answer uh, your questions during this program. So let's start. Um, let me introduce our first speaker, Gilberto. Gilberto is born in Curaçao, who's concerned with the future of our society. Gilberto is the Head of Impact, Equity and Inclusion Collectivo. He's a youth advisor for the European Commissioner of International Partnerships, Partnerships Manager for the African Caribbean Pacific Young Professionals Network, External Relations 
at Global Shapers Amsterdam and Secretary of the Supervisory Board of Stichting OCAN, an advocacy organization for Dutch Caribbean citizens and the diaspora here in the Netherlands. And folks in the climate movement might know you from the Climatic Crisis Co Coalition. Welcome. <laughs> um, in the Dutch climate media, there's this thing that Shell knew, right? Shell knew about its climate impact decades ago, yet continued polluting. And it might be news to those in the European Netherlands, but I suppose for people in Curaçao, this is not news, right? Um, or this is not surprising because Curaçao's history with Shell goes way back when Shell opened a refinery in 1918 in Curaçao. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what happened, what have been the impact since? Oh, there's so much to talk about. I guess one of the big things that Shell, the impact that Shell had had was it's, it's a problematic relationship in the sense that it provided a kind of economic benefit for the island but often the promise that it was get that that it made um, was a lie. It provided a lot of people with jobs in the short term, and a lot of um, foreign for, foreigners came to live in Curacao. People from Cuba, but also people from the other um, English colonies. They came to Curacao, so Curacao started having a a booming econ economy um, after the nineteen eighteen. But that also made Curacao uh, a type of threat, especially for um, other foreign powers. Particularly what happened in the, in the Second World War, Curacao was one of the main providers of oil for the Allied forces. Um, Curacao and Aruba both. And that meant that they were at increased risk because there would be submarines and they would have to... Um, have um, days where they have to take out all of the lights and just darken all of society because there was a lot of fear. Nevertheless, the net benefit for the Netherlands was huge. Not so much for the island. And although there was an economic benefit, the economic benefit was often concentrated in the hands of the few. The economic benefit often reflected an incredibly segregated, exclusionary um, way of doing politics. So there were people, my, my great uncle used to work for the refinery, and he would tell me stories about, oh yeah, and the, there were these neighborhoods for people from Suriname, there were these neighborhoods for people from um, the Netherlands, and there were these neighborhoods for people from Curacao. One of the interesting things about the neighborhoods were that, especially the ones for the local population, was right next to the refinery and all of the bad, you know, all of the pollution in the air and the toxic emissions would go on that neighborhood. And when you look at the health results today, um, a lot of people growing up in that neighborhood have asthma. A lot of people have chronic lung diseases that are now generational, have, um, my great uncle also lived in one of those neighborhoods and he got lung cancer. So it's, it's very interesting to see that specific well, this is such a great picture and this is very important because um, the economic injustice um, that happened on Curacao was also very it really accelerated the labor movement um, in 1969 um, we know something called uh, um, we know we know that we, we celebrate Dia de Obrero um, and that's the 30th of March. And that was also the day that protesters and workers decided that they are done being mistreated by um, the refinery, or, or as we call it there, Isla, which means island. And what's interesting, right, is that, so they were paying their workers, but often they also had contractors. And then they would pay the contractors like almost like half of the amount that they would pay the workers. But often the workers were not locals. The workers were either people. There was a there was a very hierarchical, very case like system there where Dutch people were at the top and then there were other people that were pretty either light skinned or good in Dutch. So Surin Surinamese people were also above the local people and then there was 
the local black population who were at the bottom who would also get paid less. And I think what we see now today again, to, to bring it forward to what's happening now, that the yeah the, the political issues that we see happening right now are still connected to the refinery because there was never an opportunity for the island to divest from it. If I'm not mistaken, it was in 1985 that Curacao's government bought over the Shell refinery from um, Shell. And Shell gave it to Curacao for one guilder. Um, and the reason that they sold it for one guilder was so that the government would buy also all of the responsibility of, uh, you know, cleaning. How, and because the island was so dependent on the oil trade, because there was never an opportunity to have extra income from other different things because there, it was not needed. It was not needed. It was not necessary. That ultimately, they had to do it. Because otherwise, 2,000, 3,000 people would lose, lose their jobs. Now, what was very interesting was, and it's actually very vicious and evil when you think about it, because they sold it, but then they instructed their workers to pour salt water in the pipe so that nobody else could use them. So they wanted to sell something and then damage the infrastructure so that it couldn't be used. So it's 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 it's, it's an extreme multi-layered way of manipulativeness and destructiveness. So okay, fine. That didn't happen because the workers resisted and so Shell was um Shell or now as we call it um Isla was maintained. Um that being said, obviously it's not sustainable. So what happened afterwards was back in after after the referendum in Curacao in 2010, there were more and more crises connected to Venezuela. And what we were seeing was that um after after the after Shell um left, Curacao rented it out to Venezuela. And we have very strong relationships, but the role of geopolitics plays a huge role. So when sanctions were imposed on Venezuela, the oil trade stopped. Now, I mean, as a climate activist, I'm very happy for us not destroying the environment and for kill, killing a lot of people. You know, we don't have to do that anymore, which is a very good thing. But at the same time, because of the lack of investment in any type of economic um, growth for the citizens and any type of um, sustainable ways of dealing with things, um, a lot of people were left with no jobs. And so now they're constantly seeking for a new a new company to take it over. But honestly, in this climate, um, joke, not joke, but honestly, I'm not sure it's going to happen in the way that we think it's going to happen. And so the refinery and the oil trade has had a chokehold on the economy. It has had a chokehold on the infrastructure, but also on the ecosystem. I mean, it's it's destroyed so much. Literally, they created a refinery in the middle of the port, so at the center of the island. So everything surrounding the city is polluted. And it's going to take years, tens of years, to actually really divest from that and to clean up everything. It's going to cost billions. And nobody wants to talk about it. And then the Dutch government has not taken responsibility for that because, oh, no, 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 it's an internal affairs issue. And when you have that mindset of not taking responsibility. And we see we see this behavior being reflected right now with something called COHO, which is an agreement that the Dutch government made with the Dutch Caribbean islands um, as a response to corona crisis and the islands not being able to afford a lot of things because they're dependent on only tourism, that the agreement was done under duress. The agreement was created under pressure and under no alternatives so there are no alternatives possible either you take this or you die and then you have to take it just like with the refinery you gotta take it so understanding and rounding off i think when we look at climate racism we also look at how climate injustice and pollution is created because of economic disadvantages and because of being forced to take choices that are impossible and so either you harm yourself or you harm yourself and honestly, that's the ugly truth. And if we want to change anything, we need to be able to sit with that truth. We need to be able to recognize, oh, it's crap. 
And then we can start, th- because I often feel in Europe, right? We have this, heat, oh no, we should close all of it. And I agree. I agree. But then at the same time, when we don't talk about reparations, when we don't talk about how do we, how do we make sure that the communities that have been left behind, that they are taken care of, and how do we provide sustainable and long-term um, ways of dealing with growth and with change, and we immerse people in, in new ways of thinking and new possibilities, we're not going to really change anything because climate injustice is, it is the fruits of a mindset that was toxic and that was based on domination and that was based on oppression. Um, it is only the fruits of that. You know, pollution is bad, but it's all bad because we're so disconnected from ourselves and our environment that we cannot possibly um, even think about other things. We're not like, oh, we don't care about anything because it's all about me. And when that ideology and that mindset is politicized, is systematized, is institutionalized, you get the fruits of our labor a hundred years later. And here we are. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very well much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, you're right. We have to be forced to make choices between we're forced to make a choice between two options that are both horrible and it's presented in a way that a choice is necessary, one. And second, that we can't have good things, right? You can either eat or live in a, or live in a good environment, yeah. right? You can either send your kids to school or you can have lush green fields and we need to move beyond that binary. I would love to discuss that with you later. Um, Next, uh, we also have with us Sheila Ishwardat in the studio. Sheila is a decolonial climate justice organizer uh, who worked in St. Martin for an NGO after a climate disaster took place. So Hurricane Irma took place in 2017. You were there a year later in 2018. Can you um, please tell us what the situation was like in St. Martin? Um, What was the state of the island? What was happening there? Yes, definitely. Um, so Simarte is a very unique island in so many ways. Um, it's the smallest island with two nations on it. Half of it is French, uh, colonized by the French, and the other half by the Dutch. Uh, but Simarte, the Dutch side, has its own govern- government, um, but it's still part of the Dutch kingdom. On the French side, however, it's uh, a French overseas department. Um, so the uh, the independence is, or the yeah, the independence, so to say, is uh, organized differently. And when I arrived there, I was very shocked by all the um, devastation that was still there. I arrived one year after Hurricane Irma passed, and you were still seeing these kinds of scenes of completely destroyed <coughs> neighborhoods, um, uh, neighborhoods, hotels, uh, so many places where you could still still feel the storm raging, actually. Um, and that's when I found out that there was one organization still uh, um, working there, uh, doing reparations, rebuilding housing, and I applied to join them. Um, and once I uh, was in that interview, they already um, let me know what kind of tensions there were within that organization. Uh, they didn't specifically say there were racial tensions, but they told me that they hoped that I, as a, a Dutch coming from the Netherlands, but still a person of color, could sort of mitigate these racial tensions. Um, they literally told me that they didn't uh, really trust my team, the team I would be in, which was a team of uh, uh, black women who were not all born on the island, but um, most of them. Yes, uh, so this is what they told me. This is the situation. We hope you can sort of uh, help uh, us mitigate these tensions, which was very strange to begin with, to start like that. But I thought, you know, 
I just want to uh, help as well, and I also want to offer uh, what I can do, and I joined the team. So uh, uh, getting uh, more and more in this work, I discovered that yeah, these were indeed racial tensions, and uh, I, uh, no one spoke about it. Uh, it was very obvious to me. There were literally meetings where half, well, all the people of color were sitting on one side of the room, and all the white people were sitting on the other side of the room. There was no, there was not, um, there was no rule that we had to sit like this. It it just was like this. Um, so this was a very physical um, uh, way of seeing that this racism was there. But it was not only that, there was also the tone uh, to which we were spoken to. So like how I was spoken to in that interview, but also how my colleagues were spoken to on a regular basis. There was so much distrust in the work that we were doing um, that they were behind our back checking up on the work that we did. They were making calls um, to uh, calls that we already had made to check if we really made them. Um, so these kinds of things were happening. And it was not only that. There was also uh, this structure uh, in salaries that um, people who were working for the international mission of this organization would earn this international salary while local people would be on a local salary. Because according to the organization, these people already had a house, um, forgetting that all these houses were destroyed. Um, but according to them, okay, so they already had a house and they have uh, local resources, so they ha don't have to pay as much as the internationals coming from abroad. Um, which in my opinion, was completely unjust uh, as which uh, part of the population who needs this, um, this money the most to reconstruct, to help their families, and who have lived through this hurricane. Because that was the second shock that came to me, was hearing all these stories of people that has lost had lost everything, their house, they had lost um, people close to them, uh, their, their gardens where they would grow food, everything was destroyed by the hurricane. Um, and everyone was just uh, looking to get to safety. So when I was there, um, one year after that, my role was to, to visit families and see what kind of help they needed. With, their, uh, with the rebuilding of the houses. Um, I was seeing families where they didn't have, they, they literally didn't have a house anymore. Only the bathroom was standing because usually the bathroom was made of concrete and the rest of the houses were then made of, of wood, for instance. Um, so there would only be the bathroom still standing. One year later, um, and this is something that is completely not understandable, uh, I think. And it was not only, this is not only the, the, the fault of this organization, um, because they were there to help reconstruct. So people were happy that uh, we were there and uh, uh, um, providing some kind of aid. Um, the Dutch government also had a huge role in creating this inequality. And um, I don't know if we're going to talk about that later if as we well. We can talk about it right now. Um, how do you find the Dutch government contributing to the problem somehow? Is that what you mean? Yes. So um, the Dutch government, uh, right after Irma, uh, raged by, they gave some emergency aid, so they sent uh, send in the military because, well, that's their role as a uh, uh, kingdom. This is what they uh, agreed on with St. Maarten um, to provide that first aid. And uh, later on, they created uh, 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 yeah, helping financial help package, which was a trust fund. And they gave this through the World Bank. 
um, they had uh, 550 million uh, euro that they donated um, between uh, 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 brackets. Um, and they had so many conditions attached to this aid. So the question there is, uh, who are you actually trying to help? The, I would say there were so many conditions to it that the Dutch uh, government was actually trying to help itself because uh, they had to uh, educate people in certain career fields. That was one of the conditions. Um, there was kind of conditions about corruption. There were, um, well, many different kinds of conditions. And then on top of that, giving it through the World Bank means that the World Bank adds its own conditions. So when I came there, uh, none of the money had been donated yet. And uh, I think it was only in, in 2019 that half of the money um, arrived on, on the island, and I don't know, I, I tried to uh, find out what the current status is of this trust package. Um, I couldn't find it. Um, but yeah, I think there's a clear question here. Uh, who were they trying to help? I think uh, very much themselves. And... Um, um, if the aid is not in the right place after two years, after a hurricane, that's not aiding. That's not a donation. Um, because people needed that help immediately. And you cannot wait for that money uh, and just like not have a house. And uh, um, yeah, this is one of the first essential things that we need as a human proper and safe housing. And on top of that, hurricane season is every year. So every year oh. that goes by, <laughs> there is a new risk um, of your house being destroyed again if your house is already rebuilt. So that was, yeah, the state when I arrived uh, on St. Marta in 2018. So the state was seeing a lot of mistrust and infantilization and it's just massive power imbalance and what I'm understanding then is there is an active and concerted effort to undermine the autonomy and self-determination of peoples who under law are equal to those that live in this part of the kingdom. Um, I think that gives us a good opening to <coughs> take a closer look at Bonaire, an island that has been marketed to well the Europeans for its pristine diving places and strong nature conservation but um, and since in 2019 the island was annexed as a public entity of the Netherlands in a little over a decade the island has seen a massive rise in its population so it has increased from 10,000 people to 20,000 people. All this development and sort of like an importation of Dutch and other <clears throat> rich people who come into Bonaire and buy up the land and the beaches and effectively exercise control over the water uh, raises a very simple question. What do the people who live there think about it? Like, what is hap like ha what do the local people think about millionaires and billionaires from other parts of the world coming in and buying up 10% of their island uh, with the intention of creating their own paradise or their own village. Um, if you visit Bonaire, you'll, you would notice as, um, you will notice the abundance of nature groups and organizations and national parks and marine protection and just such organizations. Um, but as of right now, Eco Con Conservation is the only green organization on the island of Bonaire that's led by a black woman. And we are so pleased that the director of Eco can join us today. Welcome, Julianka. Julianka is joining us via Zoom from Bonaire. And uh, let's start with a very, uh, very simple question. 
Do you think people of Bonaire have enough agency when it comes to their environment? So I think, um, thank you. I think people of Bonaire, uh, we do, we have always care about the environment here in Bonaire, but now, yeah, Bonaire is so diverse. We have become not only Bonaireans to really help and protect and decide about our environment and our nature. And as you said, um, there's a lot of nature conservation on the island, but one thing being led not by Bonarians is also giving it another direction. So it's misleading to think that the locals won't care about it um, because they do. And it's because we have done for all the past years that we have a marine park for more than 50 years because um, when we started um, as active Bonarians to do things, there was less bureaucracy. And it's how we have protected our nature still now that um, we're part of um, Netherlands in a more strict way. And that a lot of organizations are coming up um, with the great idea to help us protect our nature. But um, the tendency and the background that they have doesn't really um, yeah, implement on not only because I believe nature and culture go hands in hands on how we protect it. And if you are not from the island and if you're new on the island, even 10 years on the island, um, it's hard really to understand how the locals want to continue protecting their pristine island. Thank you. Um, I wonder, um, you're talking about protecting the island, but um, I also want to ask you about food sovereignty on the island. I want to ask you about farming and especially what is the gap that you see in how farming is being approached in the European Netherlands versus the colonized Caribbean Netherlands? So um, being on the island, uh, we can with a lot of problems that I think is pretty known for the locals here. And um, you're restricted really um, by the help that you're supposed to get. And I recognize a lot of things that Sheila said about um, the government um, trying to help, but in a way that you're feeling that you're not getting help by yourself. Um, the island is really known for farming and getting their foods, even exporting it to Curacao. But at this moment, uh, this cannot be done just in the circumstances that we are in. You should sure have enough money and resources um, to do farming, for, exa for example, camping with the water problem is something that we have for farmers here on the island. And if you think that as farmer organization, you cannot get like um, a reverse osmosis to still get water and do farming, but hotels come in uh, and they can get so um, they can advocate for that in the no time. Um, you see the big differences and you see why the locals cannot uh, just continue and, and develop their self in the things that they have done for a long time in an old way. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's, it's time that we um, move into the second half of a conversation having that background that we do now, which is reparations. Um, for those who might not know, um, reparatory justice is stands quite in contrast to carceral justice. It stands in contrast to vindictive justice, right? Bad things have happened. Um, a solution could be punishment. A solution could be imprisonment. But if we are to make a safe, just, green, happy feminist future, we have to figure out how to fix our relationship with each other, how to fix our relationship with our planet, how to fix our relationship within the sovereignty of the Dutch kingdom. And so in this context, reparations would include, but would certainly not be limited to sums of money from imperial powers. So instead of waiting two years to get the 50 million Oh, what, 550, 550, sorry, million. 550 yeah. million um, euros instead of waiting two years to do that. That money is already there. That money is already there in a fund. 
especially knowing that as a small island, um, uh, St. Martin is especially vulnerable and um, reparations could also include compensation, right? Recognizing that there has been great mistrust in handling of the aid and it could include rehabilitation. So the Dutch government mm. in Europe decides, all right, we have a nine month target and everyone's going to have a shelter by the end of the year. It's very simple thing to do for one of the wealthiest countries in the world, right? Um, it could also include symbolic reparations like a public apology, right? Um, we saw, I think Amsterdam was the first Dutch city last year to apologize for slavery, closely followed by Utrecht. Um, I think apologies and just public acknowledgement of the harm that the kingdom has done over the last centuries might be a place to start right there could also be room for guarantees of non-repetition uh providing assurance to victims however victimhood might be con constructed to make sure that there will not be a future retaliation or future harm um speaking of um caricom is an international is an intergovernmental organization of 15 states in the Caribbean, um, which promotes economic integration <coughs> and cooperation among, it, among its members. And in July 2021, uh, CARICOM called for climate reparations, but it's not a new thing, right? Um, for decades, centuries, those who have been harmed by imperialism and racial colonialism and capitalism have been asking for things to be fixed. Uh, I would like to hear from our speakers how they think things can be repaired. In the meantime, I hope you remember the Menti code if you'd opened it on your phones. And I would like to invite you to share your questions for um, our speakers as well. I am going to start with Julianka and I would like to know um, what is the top of the mind for you? Like, what do you think? Um, reparations for Bonaire look like? So I believe that reparation is something that you, um, it's not a one time thing. So talking about big numbers can be something, um, but really on the island, um, we shall prepare and it's a structural thing. So that is what we need to start with because um, in the nature conservation, most of the time you're dealing with funding, which is just a one time thing for you to start things. But if you're dealing with a government um, which you're part of it, um, and they also have their responsibility with you, um, they should start really helping structural. For example, our organization is doing reforestation. It's not something that you plant a tree and you go, go off and uh, that's everything. No, uh, these tree take 30 years to grow. And if we are protecting them against um, the invasive species, the grazers, uh, they shall be protected for a long time. We're dealing with salinity. So all your fences that you're building will be destroyed in like five years. So you need to replace them. And then we're, then you need like the structural funding to do so. And next to that, um, we believe that the younger generation can really help us in nature conservation because at the moment, there, a lot of locals are not involved in it. But I cannot blame them because um, to just, come around here on the island, you need to work two or three jobs. When is the time for you to do uh, volunteer work? It's barely impossible, but if you're going to school, you can help. Uh, it's how we're getting our uh, thousands of tree, tree planted out and it's by the schools, but this is all voluntary. This is um, organizations going into school and saying you shall help because um, this is something great and this is good for your island. Um, we shall go there um, to we shall be at the place that our kids are being educated on nature conservation. Our kids are being educated to value the nature that we have on the island because outside there where you guys are sitting you now, people are promoting, you know, the best, um, the, the best part, the nicest part of um, the Netherlands. But on the island itself where I'm sitting, the kids are not aware how beautiful their nature is. It's because 
you go to school half of your day or for example also to an after school if your mother is working three jobs and if these places are not bringing you out into nature it's hard but to bring kids out to nature it costs money you shall arrange buses and everything like that so i think structural funding next to structural um structural way of doing things and setting in nature education into schools is one way to repair really what they have been going wrong for a long time here on the island. Wow. Thank you. Yes. Um, I see a lot of nodding here. Um, let's let's go to Gilberto because he seemed very excited about Julianka's proposal. Huh? Yeah, so it connects to the work that we're doing with Colectivo. So for everyone that doesn't know, which is all of you, um, what we're doing with Collective is we're creating a regenerative economy by investing in ecosystem restoration and um, food forests and um, reef, um, reef restoration and healing um, through cryptocurrency. Uh, crypto is problematic. We know. We know. Um, but what we're trying to do... Uh, trust me, I know. Um, what we're trying to do is to reimagine what it means to have a local impact economy and reimagine what it means to make money that is community centered and where where money um, is based on the health of our ecosystems and social impact on the ground. What we're trying to do is um, we have a community currency on Curacao. Um, it's called um, Cura Dai. And so we're giving it out we're, um, and it's tied to the, to the Gilder. So one could die equals one gilder. We're giving it out and we're um, investing in social impact projects. And with every social impact project that we invest in, we're th thinking about regeneration. How can what we have created here help somebody else? So we're trying to create a circular economy and we're using this community currency that we've created as a foundation of that because of the way that you can kind of hack the money in such a way that it continues to do something that is good. For example, when you make a transaction, you can include something called a Tobin tax, which is a transaction tax. And that transaction tax for every transaction that is done, you can make it invested back into a social impact fund. Or another example will be with what we're doing with food forests, where we are creating digital representations of these forests. And these digital representations, we create them and we value them and we use that as an underlying asset for another currency. In this sense, we are allowing imagination and fantasy to work towards the good of the ecosystem and the material world. What we see in the economic system right now is that the fantasy, the, the imagination is so much more important than the reality. And the reality is that there is climate injustice happening and there is destruction of ecosystems happening. So if we can make the fantasy be a reflection of the reality, then it's not that great of a fantasy. And when that is not that great of a fantasy, we can realize, oh, if our fantasy created world needs to become good, that means our material world needs to become good. So we're removing these perverse incentives and we are replacing them with social impact also in a community owned way. So we don't do it on a top down level. We're designing something called Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, which is basically a glorified name for a cooperative. But everybody gets to, everybody that is part of the community and that shows that they are invested gets to participate. Everybody gets to vote um, on, on these things. And the voting is not connected to the amount of money you have, but the amount of desire you have to create social impact on the ground and to help others. And we already have some pilot projects happening um, and we're funding, I think we've given out at least 20, 30,000, um, um, guilders in, um, in funds in this very small, short amount of time. And we're going to be scaling that in the upcoming years. Now to bring it on the political level, what does this mean also for how, um, the governments need to implement it? Focus on community centered growth. Communities know where help is needed. And when you continue to gatekeep everything at the top, like, oh, no, um, we're afraid of corruption. Well, you, there are ways to bypass that. There are ways to check that. Um, there is this obsession and this 
it's it's so annoying because people continuously assume that the islands are so much more corrupt than here. Corruption here is legal, y'all. <laughs> like it's legal. Yeah. You know, we call it lobbying. <laughs> yes. And 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 the subsidies that are given often to our big polluting companies is allowed. In fact, what we don't realize is that um, paying governments off has been legal for Dutch companies until like the early two thousands. So so. When these perverse incentives are created in the system, it doesn't have to be corrupt anymore. And then you can create this imagination, this dream, this 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 this, this fantasy that oh no 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 we have good governance here, so we can tell everybody else what to do. It's honestly it's very subtle masochistic, because we're very good in um and, and we as in the Netherlands we're very good in kicking down. Um, you know, you see that with Italy, you see that with the rest of the Southern European countries, you see that with the islands. We're very good in punching down when people are vulnerable and pushing them and overbearing them with a lot of unattainable loads. And then when it comes to actually having to stand up for against against any country that has more power, we're like, no, 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 we'll do what you want. So, so we need to get with the picture and realize what is happening and that is a pattern that is historical and it's been happening for ages and it continues to repeat itself now in Curaçao and in San Martin with the Coho, um, the same thing with the decolonization, it happened in the 90s, it happened with Isla, it, it, it keeps on happening again. So how do we break this pattern? We break it by telling the truth, number one. And then we break it by investing in local community growth, number two, and also on a long-term level, when we keep people accountable with what they say and we align ourselves with values and ideals and not just fantasy ideals, but real ideals that mean something for the people on the ground instead of just like this, you know, this this recipe that has been given to you that you have to make. That's how we're going to fix it. And it's possible and we can do it and we will win. But we have to be willing to sit with the discomfort of saying, oopsies, maybe that's not that good of an idea. We will win, yes. And it's and it's rather rich, um, you know, for colonizers to accuse others of corruption and giving aid through the World Bank with a million strings attached and still having mistrust in those who are just trying to rebuild their society. Almost like um almost like um they're projecting their own ideas of what what power looks like or what uh, building a community looks like. We've heard a lot about money. Um, Sheila, do you think of reparations outside of money or do you think a few multi-billion dollar checks would be enough? It would be nice though. Yeah, if it only was uh, um, so easy and if then all the pain and uh, suffering and history and everything would be gone um, because no it isn't I think apologies isn't enough money isn't enough but um, what I really saw in this whole process of uh, how the Dutch government treated St. Martin after the hurricane and how uh, a lot of NGOs treated the people and, and uh, uh, on St. Martin is that it was so paternalistic and that they didn't listen at all to what the people wanted. The people that live there, who have lived through the uh, through, through the hurricane and the whole aftermath, um, the people that know their island, that know their community, they weren't listened to. And there were other people from outside saying, we know what's best for you. And that needs to stop. That really needs to stop. People that live there have their own autonomy, they have their own ideas, they have, they know what's best for themselves, for their families, for their community and for their island. Um, so I think that is a really important part of what, uh, um, what anyone who wants to give some kind of help need to do, listen to what people need and what people want and don't go there saying that you know best. And yeah, that is, that is something that is necessary on top of the apologies and on top of all the financial reparations that need to be made and on top of all the uh, um, environmental disasters that have been created throughout uh, history 
uh, in the Caribbean. Yeah, those who've contributed the least to the problem pay the highest price, come up with the best, most inclusive solutions, and yet are sidelined for whatever some tech pro or other university researcher or whoever might say. Um, thank you for pointing out the paternalism in the entire idea that someone living a thousand kilometers away in Amsterdam, you know, with a roof over their head, knows how money should be spent on the ground in St. Martin where the only thing left of a person's home is the toilet. So thank you very much for pointing that out. We have one question from Menti. And I would like to invite the audience, both in the room and online, to share um, any questions you may have. Um, the question's about solidarity. So, Julianka, I'll, let's start with you. Um, what do you think uh, the European Dutch climate movement can do, should do, if they should do anything? to support um, climate justice in the Caribbean? Wow. Um, I believe that uh, to start this, you understand that we have different climates. Um, and it was well said by Sheila. They should understand that we're dealing with, with the rising of, for example, beaches. And that is still from the island people, those beaches. It's not from the people who have by their houses close to it. So um, I believe looking really close with the local people on how can it be done and respect it when this is being said uh, is the only way. Because when it's being done, it's being done by the locals. And you cannot import impone what shall be done by them. Uh, so it need to be, uh, a, a work to, we need to work together in it. And then to work together, it shall be both people putting arms under it and not all the decision being imposed on the island. Thank you. Gilberto, very briefly, yeah. what does uh, international solidarity look like in this context? What does it mean for the people who are 98% of the kingdom's population to support the 2% of the kingdom's population? I mean, what the climate movement at least could do is that they could start protesting when the Netherlands wants to basically blackmail the islands. I think that's something that, if it had happened... Um, during COVID, um, we're still in COVID, but it's all, also during COVID. Um, at the beginning, we wouldn't have had these horrible deals that now the islands are bound to. So just speaking up and making also climate justice and um, focus on the island also a big part of the movement. Thank you. Solidarity. What can European Dutch climate up? movement actors do actually, if there is anything yeah i actually I, I can only join into what you've both just said um you need to speak up you need to uh get informed um uh, because well at, the, at that time uh that irma uh crossed the island i wasn't in the netherlands so i i, I don't really know what kind of solidarity actions there were, but I don't think there were really uh, great um, uh, protests, as well as when it's known that this uh, aid, uh, this World Bank fund, trust fund, was given in in such, uh, um, yeah, uh, how to say that? Um, Backhanded, manipulative. Yeah, manipulative. <laughs> yeah, that's the word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in such a manipulative way, uh, it, it was on uh, on the Dutch uh, uh, Nederland 1, 2 or 3. Uh, it, it came in bigger newspapers as well. Uh, but it, that's where it stayed. You know, it was just an article. It was just one episode. That's yeah. where it ends. And there's no action that follows up. No, there is no action. And people are living through this every day. 
it's their life. It's not an article and it's not an episode uh, that you can just like shut down the television okay. and the crisis close is over your eyes. Now. Yes, it's real. So we're inviting the European Dutch climate movement to raise the consciousness and also uh, demand better from your representatives. So thank you. Um, we've got four minutes left. Uh, if there's anyone in this room who has a question and didn't put it on Menti, please let us know. There's a microphone in the corner, so it'll be brought to you. And yeah. I have a question for Sheila. Sheila, you show. Hello. <laughs> Sheila, you showed those pictures. Oh, it was one picture. Mm -hmm. Do you also have a picture of the French side? Could you show us that one? Because you showed us the Dutch side. Mm -hmm. And was the French side as destroyed? In the beginning, it was the same. But after a year, you went there. Mm -hmm. So did you see a difference between the Dutch side and the French side? Yes. <laughs> what was the difference? Thank you very much for this uh, question. There was a huge difference, indeed. And uh, that's also why I started by saying that St. Marte is divided in these two parts, French side and Dutch side. The French side was actually um, less destroyed because of the, the, the wind, how it blew over the island. Um, however, the Dutch side is more booming in tourism. So when I uh, came there, hotels were rebuilt suddenly. Tourists can come again. And uh, there was a huge tower uh, looking over the sea, beautiful sea view uh, that was being built there. So these kinds of projects uh, were being rebuilt, um, but the housing of the actual population wasn't. So this was uh, very much the contrast that you were you, you was uh, seeing there. On the Dutch side, there were um, uh, there was a lot of uh, more uh, reconstruction going on, while on the French French side, uh, it, it there there wasn't, and there is also less of these big hotels, and uh, the tourism there is a, a little bit different. Um, so um, on the level of the housing of the population, I would say, I would say it was about the same, uh, the damage and the reparations. However, on the facade, if you would drive through St. Marta, the, 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 the main roads, it would, um, uh, it would have been beautifully reconstructed like one and a half year after uh, the hurricane. Um, but if you would look a little bit more uphill and go a little bit further into the neighborhoods, you would still see that there was so much damage and, and so much destruction still present. Yes, definitely. Right. Thank you. Um, we are at time. Um, First of all, I feel so honored to have been in conversation with the three of you today. I really appreciate the three of you having taken the time out to share your experience and wisdom with all of us. And you've given us a lot of food for thought and also some concrete points on what needs to be done. There needs to be truth and trust and investment and apologies. And we need to stop the infantilization of the of the islands and we need to talk about what's happening on the islands they're a part of this country they're a part of the sovereign nation and we need to talk about them when we talk about the dutch climate movement it's not just dikes being built on the north sea it's what's happening in the caribbean that is the dutch climate situation as well um, thank you to the audience. If you want to learn more about our speakers, you can find their social media and other on the web page where you registered. Um, I would also like to invite you to check out CARICOM's uh, Climate Reparations Ask. Um, last but not the least, um, 
Do join us on the national demonstration on March 19th, which is a Saturday, day after tomorrow, organised by the committee the 21st March. We will meet on the dam at 2pm and march to the dock worker. There is a block, uh, there's a particular green block for climate, against climate racism. And uh, we'd love to see you at the dam square. And those of you who are in the room, we are having some music in the main room between 10 and 11 p.m. So please come join us. Thank you again to our speakers, to our um, viewers uh, online and to our guests in this room. Have a good evening. Thank you.